Guys, welcome to another episode of the Plant Movement Podcast, and today's episode is special. The guest is special. He specializes in a niche of cycads. He also does bromeliads. He's a collector. He's a landscaper. He's been to school. He's done so many things, traveled the world. So excited and pumped for you guys to listen to today's episode. I introduce to you guys Chip Jones. Are you ready to grow? The Plant Movement with Willie Rodriguez of A's Ornamental Nursery in sunny South Florida is the podcast for those in the nursery business, garden centers, landscapers, power growers, and plant enthusiasts. Willie is a passionate leader in the plant movement and has helped others grow their business into multi-million dollar companies. This show will save you time, money, and headaches through top-notch education and by connecting you to experts in the industry. Let's grow. Here's your host, Willie Rodriguez. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Plant Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Willie Rodriguez, and today we have a very special guest, Chip Jones, but he's not your normal green industry type of guy. This is a guy that has traveled the world to fulfill his passion of cycads and bromeliads. He studied in different universities, has traveled all over the place, and this guy's a book of knowledge. Wait and hold on tight for this episode because it's going to be fire as usual. I present to you guys Chip Jones. <laughs> wow, that's a great introduction. Thank you, Willie. <laughs> I'm sitting among giants here. <laughs> the local hero, Oh, Willie. man. Chip, man, I've known you for a long time and you're a great guy, man. Thank you. And uh, the fact that you drove down two hours to come and record this podcast means a lot. And I really want everybody to listen to this because the guy's story is insane and what he's done. And, and, and you're still young. How old are you? 50. You're still young. 50. You're, you're still young. You got a lot more. Now I feel like it's going to accelerate as time goes on because you've become more popular <laughs> in, the past, in the past 10 years. So I want to get into your story. You filled out our questionnaire that we have. Uh, you've been in the industry for 25 years. You have a background in... You went to school for engineering and horticulture, which is interesting because they're different, but they do tie in, you know, for de depending on what you studied. But talk to me about just your background, how you got into it, your love for the industry, and what has gotten you here. Let's say, let's just start with that. So I never expected to be in Miami okay. or South Florida. I grew up in North Alabama, and okay. it's the space and rocket capital of the world. The German rocket scientists were brought to Huntsville after a brief time in White Sands, Arizona, where mm -hmm. they didn't like doing space work in the sand. So Huntsville, Alabama was all about technology. I was a math nerd, and I expected to be an engineer, maybe work for NASA. That's cool. Uh, do rockets. That's cool, though. And here I am with my hands in the dirt. And I say that I've dug more holes than any prison chain gang. Yeah, for real. <laughs> I can dig some holes. I and know. I love it. Yeah. And never get tired of putting plants in the ground. That's crazy. So you went to school for engineering. You ended up doing that. I did. I went to the University of Alabama Huntsville, which was a top-rated engineering school. Wow. I'm an Auburn fan. I don't know if you know the yeah. Alabama-Auburn rivalry, but I'm definitely an Auburn fan. Mm -hmm. But engineering school at UAH, and uh, that was great. I could do Laplace transforms. I could do integration by parts. I could just crank through some math. Um, I love Gauss's law and all of electricity and magnetism. I was an electrical engineer, but it wasn't really fulfilling. I felt like something wasn't quite right. So at one point I did this um, class through uh, community college and it was labeled as botany, which scared me. I thought mm -hmm. botanists were weird people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just wanted plants on paper. Mm -hmm. So um, I did this botany excursion to Big Bend National Park and that lit a fire in me that I wanted to know more about life. I took a biology class um, in night school and college and um, suddenly I applied for a scholarship and I got a scholarship to go back to school at 24 years old to study horticulture. Wow. And I was serious. I am serious as a heart attack. I wanted to do what I wanted to do because I knew I'd spent a lot of time getting a degree and working for engineering, which I didn't want to do anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, um, did internships. I applied to be able to travel and work in other places, uh, to get greater experience other than just Alabama. 
and I lived in a prisoner of war camp in Charleston, South Carolina for six months. For real? <laughs> yeah. That's, the, a, that's a whole, that's a whole podcast. In it was a different story. <laughs> Crazy mosquitoes. I, I had a ponytail, long hair, uh-huh. you know, total hippie. Uh-huh. And uh, it would take me 10 minutes just to shampoo all that hair. <laughs> and the shower heads were really high because they had prisoners of war. And wow. um, if the prisoners were bad they would take the shower heads off and not let them shower oh wow and you know germans are not used to hot weather and the low country of charleston south carolina it's miserable it's hot it gets it's hot, hot. Mm-hmm. so a shower it's just essential but after 40 years those pipes were pretty bad and i'm trying to shampoo my hair and slapping mosquitoes all uh-huh. over that's crazy but i did that to get experience and that mm-hmm. was a wonderful place i met scientists that um all they did is plant research that's crazy. And I started realizing that you can be serious about anything you want to be serious about. And if you get serious and then you apply yourself to it, you're going to be successful and people will grow to respect you. But uh, with my career, I was supposed to do a PhD because no one had a background in engineering and horticulture. It's two completely different, different disciplines. Mm-hmm. It's like law and medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very, very different. Very different. Mm-hmm. So you don't meet many people who have a law degree and a, or medical doctors. Yeah. So I was recruited to do a PhD, to skip a master's and go straight to a PhD. And in the end, I um, didn't want to do it. This was for engineering. This was plant engineering, plant essentially. Engineering. Okay. The project was going to be root modeling for pressure systems because um, concrete holds a lot of load, and you put buildings on roads, and roads are strong, but one little root under the concrete breaks it, and you see <laughs> sidewalks yeah, that they, are broken. They lift up. The live oaks, they do them. Uh-huh. Roots break Fragus. concrete. Mm-hmm. So if an engineer that knows plants could design concrete systems or a way to protect concrete from root, the pressure is very minimal underground. That's crazy. And just as roots grow, they do damage. That's very true. We do this a lot in landscaping with coconuts too close to a swimming pool, start to get a pool leak, Mm -hmm. gets expensive. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did is um, look at going to graduate school and... I didn't want to be the world's foremost expert on something you couldn't talk about at a party. (laughs) For real. (laughs) You'll be limited to those conversations. I'd go out and meet someone and they'd say, what do you do? And I'd say, well, (laughs) I do a climatization of liquid amber stracifluia using glomus intraradices and other vesicular or buscular mycorrhiza. Yeah, that's it. It's over. (laughs) Move on to the next guy. What do you do? Yeah, right. (laughs) Oh, that's hilarious, man. But But you're a brain. And what I love about the whole story that you just told uh, to this point is that you took a class for some reason in, in plants and you fell in love with it. It's crazy. For sure. It's crazy. But wouldn't have been for that class, you might not be here, you know, because that's what sparked, you know, interest in just life and earth and just all of that that was different than what you were studying and what you had spent so much time learning about. But you can use the two, like, look at that. They wanted you to do a PhD in, in combining the two. And even today you're using it. I sidewalks, pools, today. all the things you've mentioned. So nothing that you guys, you know, learn in life, it's a waste. You'll find something that you can use it in as time goes on, which is interesting. So you did that. You, um, you graduated. You, you were doing all that. When did you start? How did you get into the landscaping side of it? So if I look back on my life, I've done landscaping since I was two years old. For I real? cut grass when I was so short that I learned physics okay. because you want the lawnmower to go straight, mm-hmm. but the handle doesn't just go straight. It, you have to push down uh-huh, and, forward. and forward. But I was so little, I couldn't push down. I, w- I was too short. And so I was looking at the blade spinning because I was trying to walk and I was lifting the mower and I w- would have to put it oh, down on the wow. ground and let it cut and then push up and walk a little and put it back down because I was... Yeah, a little. And you're part, of, you're part of a generation, and even me, where our parents let us do a lot of crazy things that, that I wouldn't let my kids do today. But, but we, you, you're obviously older than me. You're the generation or two generations bef- uh, before me because I'm 34, but I grew up like that to the wildness, doing crazy things. <laughs> I've been working since I could walk as uh-huh. effectively, splitting yeah, basically. firewood with a, a wedge and a sledgehammer Yeah, or... Um, my neighbor 
would have me rake pine straw. Okay. And I could rake for hours and hours and hours. It was and it fun. Yeah. wasn't so much that I thought I had a payday. It yeah. was that, you know, there's a certain amount of work that needs to be done and somebody's got to do it. I cut all the neighbor's yards as a kid. I cut a lot of grass. So I've been doing it since I was little, but it was always learning more that my father went hunting and there weren't any squirrels to shoot. So we shot some mistletoe out of the trees. Okay. <laughs> and I walked around with my little red wagon with wow. mistletoe and put a ribbon around it and knocked on doors. And this little kid had a, a plant. And I realized mistletoe, maybe you don't know this in Miami. It's no. a it's a plant that lives on another planet. It's a parasite. Okay. So um, it's a plant that gets all its nutrition from robbing from another plant. Okay. We have a lot of those yeah. uh, parasites around. Yeah, yeah there's parasites yeah. everywhere. <laughs> this plant parasite people hold at Christmas, and you're supposed to kiss under the mistletoe. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a Christmas kind of thing. Yeah. And I learned that all plants have a purpose or a value, and it's something for everybody. That's crazy. So that that sparked it. So then now you you graduated at what at what age? Your last hurrah uh, in school. You were probably about, 28 years old before I started anything. 28 years old. And at that point, you wanted to get into landscaping? Or what is it that you were doing for work at that time? I expected I was going to stay in school and do a PhD. Mm -hmm. But I did a, an internship in horticulture, and I took a sabbatical, sabbatical, spent six months in a prisoner of war camp in Charleston, South Carolina, mm -hmm. um, doing forestry genetics. And it sounded crazy because I thought that I would do greenhouse production. I wanted to be floriculture to have a crop. You give me a time frame, say Easter, mm -hmm. Easter lily, Christmas, poinsettias. Mm -hmm. You know your date. You mm -hmm. can't sell a poinsettia after Christmas. It's you worth can't. nothing. Exactly. So you got to grow this. If it's too early, you can't sell it. Too late, you, you can't, can't sell, sell it. it. You got to be spot on. I wanted that pressure. I wanted to make a plant conform to my timeline. Exactly. And I wanted a space to produce the way I needed it to. Mm -hmm. And that was the engineering me. Floriculture is what I thought I was going to do, but I studied forestry genetics. And my project was vegetative propagation of gymnosperms. Okay. Okay, so in that application, it was pine trees. But, and what, what is that ex ex exactly? Well, in plants, we've got um, a long history of plants on the planet. Mm -hmm. And this is all supported by fossil record. It's not really up for debate that plants have been around for 300 million years or so. That's wild. Um, humans, a uh, couple hundred thousand years. Mm -hmm. So it's a drop in the bucket that okay. if you were to look on the timeline um, of a 24-hour period and equate the plant evolution to time, humans have been here for like the last 10 seconds. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Of mm -hmm. a 24-hour day, and plants have been here all day long. All day long. So um, gymnosperm started around 300 million years ago, and because they had ad adaptations of a vascular system and they could move water and sugars within the plant, and because they had pollen and they could make a seed and the seed could be traveled uh, could be dispersed and could travel distances without dying, um, gymnosperms dominated the planet. Okay. And so all the fossil fuels, the things we have now, the oil comes because the planet was packed with vegetation 250 million years ago in the Carboniferous period. And the plant group that dominated the planet then was gymnosperms, not ferns. Ferns are more primitive. Okay. So you look at mosses, little slime, algae, things like that, that's really primitive, been around for 300 million years. Gymnosperms like ginkgo biloba, which some people take as a supplement, but ginkgo biloba comes from a tree. Um, that's a, a living fossil. That plant has been around for 200 million years. And, and it's there, still alive. There's a rock fossil of a plant that looks just like what we can grow today. That's crazy. They don't grow so well in Miami, but they'll grow in New York City. They very pollution resistant tree. Okay. Used as a street tree and beautiful fall foliage. So ginkgo is a gymnosperm, and essentially gymnosperms have a naked seed that uh, they work with pollen and and ovule and have fertilization just like people or animals, animals or mm -hmm. or regular plants. But they have a naked seed, 
and it's not uh, the ovule is not within an ovary that makes a fruit to hold the seed. Okay. So flowering plants started roughly 180 million years ago, um, and where there are 1,500 gymnosperms now, there are say 100,000 angiosperms. Wow. So once flowering plants started, they took over, and it's the big leap. And gymnosperms are basically just relics. They're old school. It's a different kind of way. And the ones that last had something going. And when you can hold out 250 million years, you got to have the right recipe for life. For sure. So your job there was to locate that and make sure they were... They, we were looking were for a super pine tree. The whole world needs paper. And okay. we use a lot of paper, pizza boxes, ice cream containers, mm -hmm. National Geographic magazine. You Lots know, it's, of stuff. It's yeah. all on paper. Mm -hmm. So we need to grow trees to make our paper. So um, normal trees grow on an 18-year rotation, and that's lightning fast. But if you could develop a tree that did a 15-year rotation, you would turn faster. Mm -hmm. You would get a big return on your investment to uh, bring your crop in. Mm -hmm. um, when you grow things like corn, soybeans, um, even ornamental plants, uh, one year is basically a crop rotation. Mm -hmm. So you think uh, a 18-year rotation, that's a long time. That's a long time. So the industry I was in with the paper company was to look for faster growing trees and to see if we could take a, a plant and reproduce it clonally like tissue culture is happening now. Mm -hmm. um, the industry is all about using the right clone or something that grows well and taking cuttings and asexually reproducing to make that exact genetics and have a whole crop in the field of it that you can sell again and again and again. Maki, Podocarpus, Trinette, Arboricola, those are all clones. So with gymnosperms in general, you have one and they don't reproduce well. So the idea is that uh, we needed to find a way that we could reproduce it. And the problem is that gymnosperms change from juvenile to adult foliage. Some plants do this, that they start off with a leaf that looks one way and when they're young and the leaf changes. Yeah. So uh, pine trees generally do that within one year. So if you were to grow a tree and you find this beautiful super tree that's much bigger and faster growing than every other tree, congratulations, you got one. You got one. What are you going to do with that? Yeah. You don't have a forest. You can't make paper from one tree. So you got to find a way to make more. And if you harvest the seeds, they're not the same. Oh, they won't They won't grow the same as the same tree that they came off of? They don't. That's like saying you don't look like your brother. Yeah, You're exactly. not the same height, not the same size. Wow. Your brain's different. Your passion's different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So growing even seeds from the best tree possible doesn't give the same results. So the idea was to see if we could maintain juvenility in the pine trees and then vegetatively harvest cuttings and root the cuttings and then plant them out in the field and find out if we got anything that grew faster. Which will take a year, more or less. Uh, it took 10 years or more. <laughs> wow, look at all the trouble that paper companies Long -term have study. to go into just to do that. But I'm sure they buy the paper too from people that have done this already and have those trees. But it's crazy. That's a whole crazy thing that you got, got into before you got into any of the other things that you have been into. Well, but that's very interesting though. It's very, very cool. The crazy thing is that's what I'm doing now is vegetative propagation of gymnosperms. That's what you're doing. And at the time, I thought it was maybe a, a crazy thing or that it would never apply to what I'm doing in life. But cycads are gymnosperms. They're crazy fossil relic plants that are, the term we use the term extant, which means surviving their survivors. Their survivors. And it's thought that maybe 10 million years ago, it's a short time in the grand scheme of things that all the things we see on the planet now may have started only 10 million years ago and have divided. And what happened is that with ice ages and with the plate movement, the tectonic movement and mountains rising and volcanoes erupting and things changing, the continents smashed together and formed a supercontinent and divided again and came back together with Pangaea and Gondwana land, divided again and, uh, we've had big land movements and the plants that were on the planet at those times got pulled apart and that's why australia has these crazy things like nowhere else 
and islands make things speciate and make things change. If you get an island, you have everything locked into one place and you don't get any new input of genetic material. Things become kind of consistent. Mm -hmm. And over generation after generation after generation, things kind of specialize to their environment and find a niche. Mm -hmm. And you get these weird things that happen in islands. So the big islands of the world, Australia, Madagascar, Borneo, all have the most fascinating plants, Mauritius, the Seychelles, uh, incredible plants. But you, you have traveled. You have traveled to all those places in search of different cycads and bromeliads and just anything that's different. Cycads take me around the world. That's crazy. Tell tell me about that. How'd you get into that? The, your buddy's like, hey, let's go look for cycads in, in, in South America or this island in Australia. You're like, let's go. The first was a trip to Los Angeles. Los LA, okay. And I saw a man that had written a book and he was my guru he was the the author of a book and i thought that's as good as it gets you write a book you're top of the food chain yeah uh -huh. and someone said oh he receives visitors in his garden and i thought but you know not me i'm yeah. i'm nobody who am i mm -hmm. and he doesn't know me why would he let me come to his garden so at some point i got an email address and i sent an email and he said sure come visit sometime but, you know, from Florida to California, that's yeah. like saying, have your people call my people, we'll do lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically. You don't mean it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wrote him back. I said, you know, if you tell me to come, I'm probably going to show up because, like, yeah. I, I'm serious about these kind of things. Yeah. And he said, come on. So I booked a trip to L.A. and I saw his garden. And What did he have, like a botanical garden? What kind of garden was it? He was a collector. He had a Gila monster. You know a Gila monster? I do not know what that is. It's a venomous lizard from Arizona and northern okay. Mexico. Okay. He had a big one of those? He had Gila monsters. He had fossils, Tiffany lamps. Wow. But he had cycads, and he grew oxalis. You know, if you're in this industry, oxalis is the worst weed. Okay. Hard to control. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some oxalis that are actually kind of pretty to look at. Oh, wow. And, you know, there's something for everybody, I guess. But yeah. mm -hmm. he had ornamental oxalis. That's crazy. He was growing there. He had his, his In his garden. <laughs> he heard about this oxalis that was in some spot in Mexico, only grew in that one place. This man had cancer. He was terminal. Oh, wow. But he wanted this oxalis, and he flew down to Mexico to go look for it. That's And crazy. I thought, this is kind of cool. Yeah. Like, you can follow your dream. Yeah, you can. You can want something and if you don't find it you go get it you and go after it that's what i've always said it, art is if you can visualize something and it doesn't exist and you make it happen you're creating art you're doing something from the heart with passion yes and it's the same way if there are plants that i've heard about or maybe i don't know what they are and i can cultivate them long enough that i get to know them identify them um, share them with other people, then I think it's creating something that didn't exist before. It is. And just like you got an interest sparked when you went to that first class, you never know if someone can talk to you, a little kid or anybody, and you could spark that interest in them, you know, and then God knows what their, their future holds, which is crazy. So when I first met you, I went to your place that you had in Davie. Yes. Because uh, Chip has a landscape company called Jones Landscaping. And you still do work all through South Florida. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So so when I met him, we were supplying him plants. And I went to his place. This was back when I was driving. <laughs> Come a long way. And uh, he had, he showed me his collection, which was bromeliads and cycads. And he had the cycads out in the sun. And he had the bromeliads inside of a, out of, out of a grow house. And you were telling me how you would travel around to go get these things. So from, from that guy sparked an interest in you understanding that you can travel the world and go look for things. So what are some of the adventures that you have been on to go find what? Well, one of the craziest is that um, I heard of a plant that a graduate student named, and he named it for his professor. Okay. So that alone, like, you know, if you're going to name something for me, mm -hmm. sure, I'm going to support that. I'll give yeah. you a degree. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was only done with a paper collection that no one actually saw these plants in the forest so it's all theoretical okay and i decided i wanted to find out if they're actually there okay 
So this is a place in Costa Rica, and people hear Costa Rica, and they're like, oh, I've been there. I go horseback riding. I've seen the waterfalls. Yeah. It's pretty. Yeah. You know, I went zip lining. Uh -huh. I saw the coffee. Went fishing. Well, uh -huh. it's to get to places that haven't been cut down and modified by man, you essentially have to fly to San Jose, which is a couple hours, then drive out of the city, which can take, you know, it's hard just to get out of a big city like that, um, drive like five hours down to a city called Limon, which is not a friendly place. You try to avoid that at all costs. Mm -hmm. And then get on a dirt road and spend about 45 minutes on dirt roads that'll rattle your teeth. Mm -hmm. Get behind the banana plantations and out to the middle of nowhere where there's maybe just a few indigenous people living with a cow, a couple chickens, and maybe a goat. Okay. They grow some bananas in the forest, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. And the road ends where the river starts or and that's just it. the and end. everything else is ruled, just open. Then you start walking, and you get permission from a few people to cross their cow pasture, and this has been cut, and that's cut, and you go through area that's been cut down, maybe for coffee, maybe for bananas, maybe just to cut it, because there's this idea in the tropics that the only way to improve land is to cut all the trees and make it clear and plant grass. Often it's grass from Africa, so it's not native. Okay. But to modify the land makes it better. Mm -hmm. uh, so to get to forested land, you have to get out of the city, drive, get off the dirt road, walk through all the cow pasture. Essentially for a mile in any direction of a road, you won't find a native plant. Okay. All cut down. So you walk and walk and walk, and then you get to the trees. And in this case, we had to go from sea level to 4,000 feet in elevation. So if you were going to climb 4,000 feet straight up, it would take some time, and it would be hard to walk straight up 4,000 feet. Mm -hmm. But we can't scale the side of a mountain. Yeah. It's a long walk. So it's about 12 miles, camped overnight. 12-mile walk. And you did all this mile. in a day? <laughs> yeah. With you made 40, it there 50 in a day? pound backpack. Yeah. That's crazy. Through primary forest, um, fill a bottle at the river, drop some pills in it yeah, to purify, purify the water. Mm -hmm and hope that you don't run out of water, that you can find a stream further up the hill. So we slept overnight, walked even further, and bushwhacked up a ridge and all the way to the top, and lo and behold, there were psychheads there. And wow. maybe five, 10 people in the whole world have ever been there to see them, including the person who made the, the voucher, the paper specimen that I saw that made me think, is this really there, or did yeah. they get the the GPS coordinate wrong or mm -hmm. so there was a map on that paper there was some type of a map uh, it was a location a location yeah you hear something like um, Hylia mm -hmm. okay well you know if there's some plant in Hylia how do you find it yeah you go to the <laughs> city hall and you uh -huh. ask around, you ask around. Mm -hmm. no there you're probably not gonna find it so um, it can be a little tricky but and the process of getting to a truly virgin forest you pass by um, semi-wild places where orchids are in the trees because they like the high places and trees. But you can have an orchid in a mango tree. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be some native tree. Um, the aeroids climb up fence posts and climb up trees mm -hmm. on the side of the road. So you see lots of aeroids, lots of orchids, tillandsias, lots of pretty things. Just Which those are invasive over there, right? To the actual trees? No, they're not. No, um, generally, um, there are invasive things. A lot of ornamental plants have escaped cultivation, or things have been planted that get into the forest. But in general, the tropical rainforest is a pretty wild place and it takes care of itself. It takes care of itself. So so then what did, did you bring back any seeds? You brought back seeds from those psychheads? Again and again and again. I try to maintain relationships to do this the right way. Psychheads are uh -huh. protected plants. They okay. require conservation permits and it's not just the US Department of Agriculture. That has to do with just a general plant moving it around. But it, when you get into protected plants, it's like the American alligator or the bald eagle okay. or an elephant. You, okay. you don't just call up your buddy in Africa and say, send me three elephants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. bring elephants. It's a protected thing. So um, it's the Fish and Wildlife Service deals okay. with conservation and things like cacti, um, cycads, orchids okay. are protected plants. Okay. 
So the rare and endangered things, you need a, a different permit. And there are regulations for different cycads. It gets a little tricky. So you have to know your plant, know what you're dealing with. Certain things you can bring as seeds, and you can't bring a live plant. You can't just go to the forest and dig up a plant and bring it bring home it in your suitcase. Okay. That sends you to prison. Okay. Seeds, and you grow those, and you import them legally. Um, you have them inspected when you come into the country, and you have the right permits in place. As, as a nursery, I have to have a separate permit that says that I'm in the business of importing plants. Okay. And if I have that in place, then I can grow the seeds, and it can take 10 years or 15 years from seed to a mature individual. Mm -hmm. Then I make seeds from, from those. Mm -hmm. what I grew from seed, and then I have baby plants that I sell. No, oh, and you're collecting, too, things that are very rare. It's not something that's... Uh, there's cycads everywhere. There's all different types of cycads. We sell a lot of cycads. I've grown them, samias and kuntis and all those. Oh, yeah. But what you're doing is something different than all of those. For sure. But even the kunti... Um, the kunti grows in Florida. It's our native cycad. Mm -hmm. So uh, people hear kunti palm or sago palm mm -hmm. or cardboard palm. Mm -hmm. They're not actually palms. They're cycads. They're cycads. And a lot of groups, even the West Palm Beach Palm and Cycad Society. Mm -hmm. um, Miami's a little different. It's just the Palm Society. Mm -hmm. They allow people at their sales with cycads when they do their club events and sponsor sales. It's palms and cycads. They don't allow people to bring aeroids or orchids or house plants or anything. Uh, but a lot of people associate cycads with palms. Okay. They're nothing alike. They're different. And you hear sago palm. It's not a palm. Yeah. It's a cycad. It's a cycad. But the sago is from Japan. Uh, the kunti is our Florida native. Okay. And it occurs all the way from St. Augustine in the Palatka area um, all the way over to Cedar Key and Tallahassee. And then down to Miami and maybe even in Cuba, you find something that looks like our Florida Kunti. Wow. So very broad range. And um, in my nursery, I tried to get seed from the East Coast uh, Ambrosa type Kunti because it's a wider leaf. It's more ornamental. It's evergreen. It holds its leaves year round. It doesn't go deciduous and get scale and look bad. Mm -hmm. And if I grow those and have a crop of good plants, I like knowing where my seeds came from and knowing that my stock is the best possible. Oh, yeah. With cycads, it's just that they don't exist. You can't call up your local big box store and say, hey, um, Home Depot, do you have any cycads for sale? Mm -hmm. they, don't. they don't. And if I want it, I've got to go find it. There's nobody that could bring it in. And generally, it's all botanical gardens and institutions that are able to do the travel and the collecting. And as a private individual, it's kind of my hobby to go find these things. And the goal is that if I find something that looks really beautiful and people like it and I can make it available, it's a niche, it's a, it's a specialty product. Yeah, and as time goes on, it's not it's not that turn and burn, you know, fast, fast ROI on your investment, but it's something on the collector side of it that you have the landscape company that brings in the bread and butter to continue eating. That's right. And then this is your hobby, your collection that you're turning into things. I have two things in regards to this. Have you put something together or been a part of something where a bunch of like a group of people can go uh, on, on a uh, trip like that and go look for something in particular? I get people all the time that message me or ask me like, hey, if you're ever traveling and you need somebody to go along. Yeah. Um, I speak Spanish or, you know, I have the skill or mm -hmm. I like to travel or um, take me with you. And occasionally I call up someone and go, hey, you know, like, you, you want to go, go to Peru? Yeah. Um, but that's cool. Have you ever thought of doing a group, 10 people, five? I know more. the more will be more of a mission for everybody. But uh, I just did a trip to Peru, and there were three of us. Three of us. So small group, right? And um, everyone had a skill, and um, we had a local guy that was going to be with us and um, like rented a, a car. Guide, like a tour guide? type guy who's um, a local local guy let's say you're a tour guide yeah mm -hmm. so uh we ended up with something equivalent to a nissan Sentra. okay and this thing was tricked out i okay. mean it was <laughs> it had its flare uh -huh. so <laughs> it had um, its flare <laughs> i love it oh love it had the reflective back. tape strips yeah. down the side uh -huh. and it had a spoiler on the yeah, back yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. you know 
something uh, fun. <laughs> tented windows with the rain guards around uh, uh, it. And that so was your car? The car came with a driver. We okay. couldn't just get the car. Okay. The car had a driver, and this was a large guy. Uh -huh. So he took the driver's seat. Um, the guy sat shotgun, and so it was three of us in the back yeah. of a Nissan Sentra. <laughs> and we had one day that was a 17-hour drive. Oh, Lord, that's hilarious. Did it have air? Probably. Well, up there, it all depends. It was cold it was coming cold. home, okay. and we were wet because, you know, hiking and getting yeah. off-road, and you've got to climb up mountains and yeah, yeah, scramble yeah. off the highway and get into the jungle and then climb through places you've never been, mm -hmm. uh, look for things and, and, you know, figure out what you're seeing and where to go. So soaking wet from sweat and whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. and... Um, we're driving home and it got cold at night. The temperature oh, no. dropped and the driver wanted the windows down because he said it kept him awake. Oh Lord. And this is three grown men like <laughs> smashed together. You guys and are hugging like, each other at this point. We're already to stay touching. Warm. <laughs> yeah, let me just like cuddle up a little and keep me warm. <laughs> That's hilarious, man. But those are, those are the fun things that happen on trips like that. You never know what you're gonna get into. You're in another country with a tour guide, you don't even know who he is in a flared car. Yeah. You know, like climbing. I know, man, freezing to death. Freezing on the Amazon. But that's what happens, and it is what it is. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is you have given speeches about things like this at Botanical Gardens, correct? I try to promote the industry and the education for the plants. It's not, psych heads are my number one, and mm -hmm. I really enjoy psych heads. But I do a lot more talks on bromeliads. Yes, because um, you know a lot about that as well. This three-month period, the springtime, I've got Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Vero Beach, uh, Tampa, uh, Sanford, which is the Seminole group in, in north of Orlando. Um, These the, are all speeches you're going to be giving. Yeah. What, do you have that anywhere? Eddie, let's write that down so we can post it up. Yeah, I can give you some dates. Mm -hmm. um, Guys, we're going to have the dates for his stuff. We'll put it in the bio. We'll put it in the bio just so you guys see it because if any of you are interested and want to go listen to Chip or go meet him, go say hello. He's going to be talking at all these places, five, six, seven places all through Florida. I do so, a lot of psych head talks. I do palm talks, um, but bromeliads a lot. Yeah, and if you don't know by now, he's a very smart person when it comes to this. <laughs> So we can talk about this for a minute. Okay. I want to give a plug to the Florida Council of Bromeliad Societies, the Bromeliad Extravaganza. It's not an annual event. This is only done every few years, but this is the, the event to end all events. If you like bromeliads, um, Chester Skotak is coming from Costa Rica. He is the bromeliad magician. He doesn't do speaking engagements. Okay. You can't get this man to talk. I don't know what they're paying him. I don't know <laughs> what they promised him. But they, he says- They got him a is, rare bromeliad. He's got it all. He is my guru. Um, Eloise Beach is amazing, but David Shigi is another guru from Hawaii. And it, of all foliage regias, he is the hybridizer, uh, the best in the world. Wow. Uh, world known. So this is all coming to Florida, and it's going to be right here in West Palm. Uh, it's East Coast. Everyone can go. Uh, unfortunately, I will be in the Philippines. I won't be there. Okay. Um, the conference on psychad biology is every three years, and it didn't happen due to COVID. It was supposed to be in Cuba. Cuba is difficult to arrange to begin with yeah. to get a conference with uh, foreigners to go and do a, a convention. Mm -hmm. And then you add COVID, Cuba couldn't handle this. And so um, the Philippines stepped up, and it's been a number of years since there was a conference. But this is all scientists in the Philippines. That's crazy. And I get man. to see psychheads in Southeast Asia. That, that's so cool because like my, my side of the industry is completely different than, than all the things that you have talked about today. Obviously, I do grow and sell some of the psychheads that, you, that, you are, that you've talked about today. But it's so cool and so interesting that there's people that are actually gurus, best in the world, that they get to meet up and talk about things like this and scientists and just so cool. There's so many different – the, the industry is so vast. There's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of things that go on to make the green industry the green industry. <laughs> and I feel like every day I hear something new. And it's crazy that that happened. Talk to me about this book. You, you put this book together? You were part of putting this book together? Yeah, this is volume two of the Psychad Horticulture Handbook. And there are books on taxonomy and how you know one plant from another, identifying plants. Okay. Uh, but this relates to horticulture and how to grow them. 
how to grow, and this is specifically cycads. This is only cycads, and the goal was that there are cycads in botanical gardens around the world, and a lot of the employees at botanical gardens come to work at a facility or a institution, and the cycads have been there long before they started working there. Mm-hmm. And they may not know how to take care of them. And we wanted to be able to give people something that they can just look at a handbook and say, okay, this wants sun, this wants shade, this needs water, this can cannot tolerate flooding, and those kind of things. So they um, And Nang Nuuk is a famous garden in Thailand, one of the most beautiful, maybe the most exciting garden in the whole world and it's privately owned and the man who owns it is a big fan of palms and cycads and he has miami connections he's done a lot of collecting in miami to get seeds to take back and grow them in thailand and thailand's an amazing plants for uh, a amazing place for plants so uh this garden hosted a conference for horticulture of cycads and it brought people from around the world european people australians americans uh, South Americans, so African people. Uh, a lot of cycads are in South Africa and can go for thirty thousand, fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars for a plant. For a plant, yeah, <laughs> that's crazy, man. So people who would like that book, or would, yeah, where could they get it from? how can they get this book? So Where's you can contact at? me. This was distributed at a conference on horticulture, and uh, I did a printing here in the U.S. I have the books, and I give them to my customers. This book's for you, Willie. I'll sign Thank it you. for you. Thank you. Uh, if you come to my place and you want to know more about Psycheds, most likely I'll send you home with a book. Awesome. Um, you can download a PDF on the Psyched Specialist website. It's a, The Psyched Specialist is a, a subgroup among the IUCN Red List which is an organization that deals with rare and endangered plants around the world, uh, plants and animals. And the IUCN has a group of specialists who are mainly scientists, and they have meetings periodically to discuss what's happening in the world and the conservation of cycads. Cycads are totally the poster child for conservation because as the planet gets more and more people, more and more forests are cut down, there's no habitat left. Wow. Oh, yeah, so it's something important. It's just like the animals, like you said, the elephant and all that. Sign. <laughs> Guys, he's going to sign action. it live right now. No, man, it, it's it's definitely interesting and de- definitely cool that from an interest that sparked by taking a class, you guys are listening to what this man has been able to just learn and achieve and fearless and let's go to Peru and let's go here, let's go travel the world and let's go learn. And from doing it, he's, thank you, from learning, you know, from, from that, he's been able to meet people around the world that have his same interest, especially now the way social media is and the world with the internet. Um, you can type in something and find people that are interested in it. So that's super, super cool. You have, I'm assuming from your background and all the things that you have, um, you know, done and achieved, uh, you are putting together at your nursery you want to set it up not like a botanical garden but explain what you're doing there for people to come and see you i'm going cool. broke is what i'm doing you're going broke i know he's la- he's he's planting the plants over here and, and at the landscaping and dumping it over here my landscaping supports my travel my conservation work and my collection mm-hmm. uh it's hard to have a nursery when half the nursery is my personal collection yeah, and yeah, not yeah. for sale and yeah. people come and they want to buy it and it's like i've only got one i can't yeah, sell it I can't to you sell it. so i wanted a place where i could have uh, areas where everything's for sale you see it it's for sale you can buy it okay. just ask the price or you know get the price off the list and you got it uh and i wanted my collection off to the side so i do landscaping i love putting plants in the ground i love doing design i'm really good at design i like Mm -hmm. doing landscapes that keep a scale you put it in looks good the day you plant it looks good uh, six months from now when it all catches and starts to grow a couple rainy seasons later still looks good and then you ride by 10 years later and it's like hey i planted that yeah i know i love that just right yeah Mm -hmm. so i do landscaping and i do a lot of landscape lighting lighting Mm -hmm. gives you the nighttime yeah and Mm -hmm. you enjoy the garden twice as much yes so uh, my nursery has my collection plus everything for sale. And I bought collections from people that grew cycads for 30 or 40 years and then died or retired or moved and had to find a home for their plants. And so I just keep getting more and more. Who better than Chip? 
plus I grow them very well, mm -hmm. um, but I try to make them available. I have someone that could call and say, hey, I'm looking for a garden plant that gets four to six feet tall. Um, I would need to plant it the size, or here's my budget. And I say, you know, here are five different choices. Mm -hmm. um, they want a plant, I deliver it to them, and you know, they you get can plant the two for them. specimen plant. I work a lot with the sales. There's eBay and Etsy have done a lot for the mm -hmm. rare plants. Okay. Um, it's a different industry than landscaping where you work in volume and you work the same kind of plants. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's different, the collector market versus plants you find in a bank parking lot. Okay. So um, one side is the rare and exotic things where people already have a garden and then they just want some bling. They mm -hmm. want something really rare that their neighbor doesn't have. Yes. Um, some people just want something really pretty. They don't care the name of it. The landscaper just says, give me something that no one else has, mm -hmm. but it's got to perform, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to be in the shade or in the sun. And generally there's a psych head for any spot and they are incredibly slow. So whatever people ask all the time, how big does it get? And my answer is always how many years, Yeah. you know, you want this, you want to know that how big in five years or how mm -hmm. big in 25 years. Yeah. Because in five years, it's going to be pretty much the same size. <laughs> yeah, because they take forever to grow. They're pretty slow. They're pretty slow. I, I went to a nursery down here that had these, I don't know if they, I think they were cycads. They were 100 years old. I think they were cycads. I forget the name. It was Australian something. But oh, it was. Yeah, I imported those. You imported those? I from saw Australia. your picture at Native On Tree Instagram? Nursery. Yeah, it was, it was beautiful. And he was explaining to us about it how. They grew them there, but then they moved them, and they came from somewhere else, and they moved them again, and then oh, they yeah. bought them, and they brought them here, and they're a hundred year old. The big, big, big. Yeah, the big ones. So I could show you pictures. I brought those in an open sea container. So Chip's the one that brought them. Yeah. <laughs> how, how we connect the dots? They're at my nursery now. Um, I've I I wholesale those, and I plant them in jobs. If you want one, come tag the tree you like. I can deliver it and install it better than anybody. Um, but there are nurseries in Homestead, and so I try to protect my wholesale customers. And the pricing is all basically the same that everybody um, does well with it. But I um, got those salvage collected in Australia. They grow there in two different locations, one in sand. And when they're on the sand, they pull themselves underground, and um, they can have a lot of trunk underground. And the other is on, right on basalt rock. And so these are harvested out of sand and the farmers don't like it because um, they have toxins and it makes the cattle uh, oh, crazy and okay. things like that. Or if they want to clear the land and plant grass for cattle, they have to get rid of all the native vegetation. So the government allows so many to be harvested and they're salvage collected and they're legally harvested and they're pulled out and the roots are cut off and the leaves are cut off and I just get a trunk. Trunk with a ball. And they dip them in a big cattle trough and the pesticide and make clean them up and then they pressure wash them with a 2000 PSI pressure washer and lay them all out on tarps and grade them according to size. And there's size limits of what can be imported into the US. Okay. And then when it's time to load a container, they dip them again in pesticide in a cattle trough to make sure that we don't bring any um, um, any, invasive any pest in mm -hmm. and then they go in an open sea container um, 10 weeks over the ocean all the way from Brisbane Australia into Miami and I clear the containers here and then pot them up and it takes about six months to go from something that looks like a log just a stump to starting to push out, oh, leaves. To push out leaves and within about two years, there are these things that cost thousands of dollars. They're and beautiful, when you see it, your heart skips a beat. Man, like, when I saw that thing, you remember? I was like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? Those are my babies. That's crazy. They are That's, beautiful. That man uh, that harvests those is a friend of mine, and he's amazing at what he does. He can load huge trees in containers and ship them to Dubai or to Everywhere. Abu Dhabi or Singapore. Uh, but he harvests these uh, psych heads. And so I met him in Thailand, handed him a personal check for a container load of psych heads. Mm -hmm. We toured around and looked at plants and flew back home. He flew home. He loaded my container, shipped it to me. And I've done that a few times to bring those in quantity. So that's uh, my work is to make things available that have never been here. And there is a man in Homestead that spent 25 years growing those from seed. 
and the seed's large. It's you know the size of a, uh, a plum or, or a guava. And it took him 25 years with drip irrigation, perfect lighting, perfect watering, perfect fertilization, good growing media, um, growing in a container, not you know where it doesn't rain for six months in the forest and, and harsh conditions and fires and things eating it. Uh, in perfect conditions, in 25 years, he basically got these beautiful leaves, but no trunk. Oh, wow. So he saw my plants come in with all this trunk, and he said, <laughs> we estimate 50 to 200 years. That's crazy. 200-year-old plants. And they're big. They're like the, the ones that we're talking about are big. They're big. The trunks are like this big, probably about the size of this table, or a little smaller, a little skinnier. I remember the head being, the head opening up, and then it had fronds. It was like, probably like a 12-foot span. Something like that, a little About smaller, seven but yeah. feet tall. Something like that is the ones that I saw, but they were they were on another level, of beautiful. So if someone wanted something special in the cycad world, from anywhere in the world, they could reach out to you. It's hard to say. I want something. Go get it for me. I know it, it's hard. It's not a brokerage thing. I generally work three years in advance. Okay. That if I want to sell those Macrosamia morii, I brought them in as stumps. I potted them, uh, grew them out. And I price them so that every six months, if you want a container, I'll bring you a container. I'll clear the shipment. I, I do it well because I've got the experience and I know what it takes to get through the inspections. Customs, all that. Mm -hmm. So um, you can get a shipment and you get the plants at a reasonable price. You grow them yourself. It's just like importing Dracaena cuttings from Costa Rica mm -hmm. or Heliconia yeah, tubers. Yeah, yeah. You bring it in cheap and grow it. But if you want a finished product, I have to spend two or three years growing it out. And if I'm selling them quickly, I have to keep importing now or growing from seed now if I want to sell it to you in three to five years. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly acquiring, constantly doing more. And it's the same in nurseries. Like I hear people say, uh, I talk about the sweet spot for a crop. You grow certain crops and they just sit there and month after month after month, this whole crop does nothing. You can't move it. People look, but they don't buy. Mm -hmm. Suddenly somebody buys one. The next day, somebody else buys it. Yes. Next thing you know, the entire block's gone. gone. And you're like, mm -hmm. what's different today than yesterday? Than yesterday. Your crop has to hit a sweet spot. And every crop has its own sweet different spot. sweet spot. So palms, it's a little different. Some people want Christmas palms. Is that six-foot triple. Mm -hmm. And you move a lot of six-foot triple Christmas palms. Mm -hmm. You can get... 20 foot Christmas palms, but they're not as common as you as don't the move sixes or the eights mm -hmm. nearly as many. So mm -hmm. you learn your crop, you learn what it is you're growing, where you're going to sell it. It's called the finish. When you put it in the, the pot, that's the last size it's going to be. And you know, at that point it's going out the door, it's going to its home. It's going to be planted in the ground on a job. That's the finish. Yeah. And so, uh, if I want to have a finished product in psych heads, I got to work three to five years in advance. And you need a thousand acres and a, hundred, a couple hundred million dollars. <laughs> I started with a quarter acre lot just using my backyard. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, if I can go out and buy it, I'm not going to take my space and grow it. Okay. And most people come and I hear again and again at my farm, I've never seen that. What is this? I've never seen anything like it. And it's like, perfect. That's that's, that's my goal. Want. Yeah, that's what you want. If you have seen it everywhere else and it, you can call someone and ask for it by name and, and order it, yeah. I'm not going to have it. it. You don't want it. I do grow podocarpus and the irony, I, I did a... The Mac eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did an orchid show in Fort Lauderdale and I supplied their foliage mm -hmm. and they make each vendor separated from the others by vegetation and okay. it's a beautiful, beautiful show that they do in Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. And they would ask me to get their podocarpus, but they had certain size requirements. And in the industry, those plants just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so I grew them myself to be able to make that size available for them. And I got into growing it. And the irony now is that podocarpus is actually a gymnosperm. It makes a little berry, little like a juniper, mm -hmm. and um, it's a naked seed. So podocarpus fits in with my cycads that it is a gymnosperm. Yeah, so they have something in common at least. Yeah. That's hilarious, man. So before we finish, uh, you work in South Florida. Your landscaping stuff is all in South Florida. I go wherever nice people are. That yeah. uh, The best customers are people who like pretty things, mm -hmm. that want something nice, that uh, educated customers are my favorite. Okay. 
Um, so I've worked um, in the Keys. I've worked all the way to Jupiter. That's my normal range. But in general, Fort Lauderdale is my home base. On the east coast of Florida. East coast. I now live closer to the west coast, and I've actually done jobs in Utah where I filled a suitcase with all the irrigation, and <laughs> um, I took all the parts out with me and yeah. built the sprinkler, had the grass scheduled for delivery, had granite boulders there, had soil there, had to hurry up and push soil around with a bobcat mm -hmm. and um, start trenching because the sod got delivered, and I laid the sod out and areas so I could trench in between the sod and mm -hmm. drop the sprinkler in. And the neighbors thought I was insane that the sod <laughs> was delivered, the topsoil wasn't down, and the irrigation wasn't in. Mm -hmm. So um, I got it done in a weekend and um, did a turnkey residential property with rock gardens and vegetables, flowering trees. And for Christmas, the customer asked what I wanted, and I said, I want a picture of the kids playing on the lawn. And I got mm -hmm. a picture of a group of children playing, playing football on this grass that so I put, put down. So I can work anywhere but uh, Fort Lauderdale, and I do a lot in Miami. So consulting for, you know, why is it my garden growing or what's wrong with this tree um, or how can I make this look better, knowing the strengths of your landscape. Some people think the only way to do it is tear it all out, cut it down, and start from scratch. From scratch. But if you've got good bones, you can repaint the palette and just put a few nice pieces in and some color and um, redo a few shrubs and suddenly you repaint the palette. You've got a gorgeous garden and you don't have to wipe it clean and start from scratch. Yeah, especially things that are older, they, they get character and you can trim them back and they can fluff out, they can flush out and, and, and you want those pieces. I'm fascinated by how plants come and go mm -hmm. and featuring palms and cycads, sago palm you can't give away. When I started in the industry, Everyone had a Sago, whether it was a trailer or a $10 million mansion. A King Sago. Yeah, a Queen, a yeah, King Sago. King. King is the short, Queen is the big. The Psychus Revoluta. <laughs> the common names. Yeah. yeah. So you can't give them away now. Mm -hmm. And I would tell my customers, hey, go to a movie. And when you get home, just, just go out for a bit. I'll cut it down, dig up the stump. I'll replant something and it'll be better than ever and no more chemicals, no pesticides. So it changed the, the, the market. There's a trend that you don't do sagos now. What replaced it? Foxtails came on the market and the foxtail palm was the hottest thing. You could sell a foxtail palm seed for $10. Now you can't give them away and you pay someone to come pick the seeds up when they fall in your yard. Mm -hmm. So foxtails are kind of out, but it's still a beautiful palm. It's still yeah. beautiful palm. We move a lot of them. And the Segos too, we still do. But um, like what, like on the trend topic, like what we were talking about um, earlier, was that the King Sago gets scale. Yes. We used to, I used to do King Segos, and I stopped doing them because it was just so expensive for the chemicals. And where the market was at that time, I couldn't get more than $20 for a 7-gallon. So think about that putting all the pesticides, the time and everything, they get the scale, then you have to cut them back, leave the bulbs, wait for them to, to um, sprout leaves again and all of that. So I stopped doing it, and that's all from a scale, right? So that's what happens with the trends. Ficus used to be one of the most popular hedges, oh, yeah. uh, Ficus benjamina, and now people hate it. Even though to me, I think it's still one of the most elegant hedges. When it's done right and you see it trimmed perfectly, flush, fat, oh, to me it's like, yes. Yes, I like that. <laughs> it's hard beautiful. to give away a ficus. And Clusia, same thing. That uh -huh. you but realize. Clusia right now is super popular and it's been popular. But let's see. I know it's going to change. Something else. At least Podocarpus are still strong. <laughs> Things do come and go, and, and it has to do with what sells the best ends up flooding the market, and suddenly people want something different. Mm -hmm. So as far as cycads go, uh, the Dione Spinulosum. Mm -hmm. Spiny Dion, Dion Spinulosum, or Dion Edgeley have replaced the King Sago. Yes, they have. And we they do not get this. scale. And again and again, when I would suggest cycads to people, they would say, don't they get a disease? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bug, uh, which technically could, you could call a disease, but mm -hmm. it's an insect. And no, um, only one of the ten types of cycads get that problem, and it becomes life-threatening. So if you do Dion, nice replacement. Um, and the trend I see is that um, Dions are hot, and a lot of 
nurseries can't meet the demand. I get calls for them all the time. How many? I need 15 of this, seven of that, um, three to four feet, and diones are hot. They're hot. They definitely are. What do you see, you with the knowledge that you have, what do you see for the next five years for the industry, or even 10, when it comes to what you do for SciCADs? You see more people wanting to grow them? You think more people should grow them? I think more people should grow them because you plant it and it sits there. You don't trim it. You don't do anything to it. Um, as far as the customer goes, the, if they have to pay someone to come do hedge trimming every month, they're throwing money in the garbage, literally. That mm -hmm. They're paying for someone to pick up clippings and throw it in the garbage. Mm -hmm. If you put it in a plant that takes less maintenance, it gives you more money to buy more plants next year. It does. It and definitely does. So someone listening that is maybe an enthusiast that actually wants to jump in, a SICAD that there's so many different types would be something easy to propagate. You can get the bulbs, okay, from a liner place. I don't want to give too many names or any names, but you can find them around. You can go on Etsy, you can go on eBay, you can buy them there, and you can start in your backyard, and you can end up like Chip Jones traveling the world because that's the truth. My last question for you today, Mr. Chip, Mr. Jones, is... Um, what advice do you have for individuals or businesses looking to grow in the green industry? The best advice I got and when I was in horticulture school was if you want to be in business, you need a cell phone and a truck. And if you want to go out of business, you don't answer the cell phone. Okay. <laughs> so that's the thing with Willie is every time I call, he answers the phone. Yes. And he's a successful guy. That's and that's what it takes, like answer the phone and listen to your customer. Again and again, like when I do landscaping, I don't live in that house. I'm only there to do the work and then I go home to my place and I landscape it the way I want it to look. So when I work for a customer, I listen to them and I hear the things that they like or don't like. And I try to talk to them a little bit and get to know and ask them questions to find out what they like. Um, and if you give them something pretty, something that they like, something they appreciate, they're going to remember you, invite you to that party. You'll be the guest of honor. Yes. And you'll meet other people that need landscaping. Very true. And it moves from there that you got to keep people happy. you got to listen and know your product. Get to know plant names. Um, learn the scientific name. It's not that hard. Usually there's a reason it's got a name. The name means something a lot of times, either where it came from or who found it or it uh, refers to the characteristic of the plant, the color or the shape of the leaf or something. Um, so get to know your plant names and be able to talk to people in the industry based on the actual name. You say firebush um, and the customer's like, oh, I want that fire plant. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how do you call a nursery and go, hey, um, I need 10 of that fire plant. Yeah. Um, so if you can be specific about what you're asking for, get a cultivar you like, like, uh, Always learning new names. What's the one we just did? Emerald Carpet? The, no, the Emerald Blanket. Emerald Blanket Carissa was a new Emerald one Emerald Blanket, me. yeah. And that's a cool plant. Yeah, it's super cool. Uh, and, it, and it fills up beds very, very nice. And you can trim it. You can pretty much trim it with an edger if you wanted to. It's better than the Jasmine Minima, right? Well, the Jasmine Minima is different. It's more viney. It's a, it's a vine. And the other one isn't. So it's not going to grow up anything. But the, but the Minima, it's the same thing. It's just green. Minima is green. It has some brown to it. Ground Different cover. colors. Ground covers. Yeah. That's what they are. I learn every single day. And what you said is 100% true. Come through. Answer the phone. Um, it's not hard. Um, my father taught me at a young age that uh, you got to be a man of your word if you want to be successful. You don't need money. You don't need money. What you need is be a man of your word. That's and, right. And I, I truly believe that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Also God and other things, but that's what I believe. <laughs> and it's taught me a lot. Always coming through, being honest, and stuff like that. Chip, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I know one day we will have you back on. Okay. All right. You just, you just know so much, and we we're only able to touch a little bit today. Guys, um, we're going to have all of his information, all of it, down on the link in the bio below. He has Instagram. Um, and he has Facebook and other things. We're going to have everything there. If you are interested in reaching out to him, can people reach out to you 100%? Always. So you can reach out to Chip if, if any of this stuff has interest, interest you. Uh, he is literally a book of knowledge that this is a small book, 
maybe 40 pages, 50 pages, he can write a 10 million page book. <laughs> <laughs> and his buddies <laughs> can fill up the rest if he can't. So, Chip, thank you, man. I appreciate your time. I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Stay tuned because we have other people that are already booked to come on the podcast show. So don't forget, we put them out every two weeks, or at least we try to. Sometimes we get backed up. I'm only running a business. <laughs> a couple. <laughs> but guys, stay tuned. We love you. God bless you. And you already know the next one's going to be fun. All right? Take it easy. Thank you for listening to this edition of The Plant Movement. Willie and Eddie invite you to connect with them on Instagram at both The Plant Movement Podcast and A's Ornamental Nursery. Those links are in the show description. Please leave us a well-worded five-star review on Apple Podcasts to help others find the show. And remember to tap the follow button so that you'll be notified when the next edition of The Plant Movement is available.